Are you ready? Are you ready? Here we are. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of anything now, baby. My first love was music. It was before the movies. I didn't want to live my life just denying myself because I was fearful. Thanks for going to the movies all these years, you guys. Thank you very much. They come from a curiosity standpoint for the, for, at first. Uh, those that have heard about the music will come in because maybe they've heard about it. And then there's some people that just kind of come in off the street. But the, the biggest majority is there of a curiosity. When the band kicks in, it is like a wave. You can be sitting there, and when you feel the band pick up, it's like a wave picking you up. I like to perform. I like the drama of it, because a lot of stuff can go bad. Um, when I played sports, I liked the idea of taking the last shot. But the idea was like, why would you want to take the shot? You know, you can ruin everything. It's like, yeah, but you can also win. You made it this far, cross your heart with mine and let your light turn on, turn it on. I knew that the minute I decided that I would do music, that I could have my head handed to me. So I had to be very certain at my age, married, that I wanted to do this. You ask somebody to pay to come see you. You have to deliver something. You, it, it, it can't be an experiment. If you want to know what life is for, hey, this is it. Listen, I've taken some big bites out of life, but life has taken some equally big bites out of me. You never blame and you never explain. You just kind of try to go through, try to go through life as heroically as you can. Are you worried that since you are an accomplished actor that people aren't going to take you as a musician seriously? I'm not worried uh, about that, I, I, but I'm, I'm a realist. I know that people will do that, and that's okay. Um, uh, I'm not out to prove anything to anybody. What I have to make sure is my kids know that I'm not timid about what I try to do. And this, the easiest thing would be to stay home. The hardest thing sometimes in life is to show up. I knew that there's some people laying in the weeds willing to cut my head off and watch it roll in the street if I failed miserably in front of a bunch of people. But um, I also knew that before I would ever be in that position, I would have a really good feeling about if this band had the firepower to do that. I perform because I kind of have a desire to perform. And if you, uh, I also know that when I perform, I can get better. You know, there's a lot of people that if they can't succeed right away, they're just gonna stop. I knew that when I first started acting, I wasn't very good at all. I was, in fact, I was awful. But I knew in my heart, because I knew that's what I wanted to do, that I would get better tomorrow. And I would be better the next day. And so uh, the band has no resemblance to how we were, uh, you know, five years ago. I was born in Compton, California, but I, I think I pretty much grew up in Ventura County. For me, it was uh, a 
pretty magical on a certain level. It's not that my family was poor by any stretch, but the tennis shoes you went to school in were the same tennis shoes you played your basketball in. I didn't realize we didn't have a lot till I walked into somebody else's backyard and saw they had a pool. I was like stunned, you know, because I thought my backyard was a, was a kingdom. My dad would be back there with me. My grandmother played the piano in the, in the church. My mom was in the choir. His, her sister was in the choir. I, the church was part of our life, so I grew up singing. That's how I was trained, so music was a part of it. When I uh, left college, I knew that I wanted to become an actor, and at that point, I engaged in a, in a group. None of us had any money. There was about 30 of us, and inside that group were rock and roll people. There were actors. There were writers, and none of us, the only thing we had in common is no one had any money. And there were a lot of actors that wanted to be musicians and Kevin was one of them. He, uh, he always loved music. And when we met, I was playing a lot of clubs in LA. And, uh, and so he used to come out and hear me play and, and liked my music. And, uh, and I liked his acting. And, uh, and so we, you know, we just sort of began to play some music together, tinker around a little. At one point, Kevin said, said what, do you, what do you think about like building a band together? And see what we could see what we can accomplish, and, and I thought, well, yeah, I mean, we should give that a try. So, and so you you went out and you got Blair. That was the first step. Well, Blair and I had been playing together for a long time. We had been playing together for about five years at that time, and then we had, we were playing with a drummer. So we just brought just both of those guys into a band. So that band was called Roving Boy. Called Roving Boy after uh, the famous racing horse. Somebody heard one of our songs for a beer commercial, literally for a beer commercial. And so we sold the song. Looking at the faces of people all around me. Well, when the, when the song came out in um, Japan, it made its way back here, and a reviewer reviewed the song, reviewed the, the, the record. And he was rough on the record, and he was really rough on me. And it was, that was at a moment when I thought, do I need this? Do I need this kind of, you know, acid thrown my way? And it was the first time in my life where I backed away from something I love. I said, I'm not doing this. You know what, I love this, but I'm not doing this. And I pulled the plug. Kevin's rise in the movie industry was, was kind of unprecedented. I mean, he just shot to the top really quickly. And at the time, we, we had a record deal in Japan, a number one single over there, and, and uh, chances of doing another record and uh, touring Europe and Japan and then it just couldn't happen. I want to live in Tokyo. We just kind of harvested the fruit quickly from that vine, <laughs> from that band, and then uh, decided to wait until the time was right to do it again. Stayed very close with John, stayed close with Blair, brought them on movies, we did things together. It was only about 20 years later that my wife, um, discovered the music through my my kids. And she began to ask me about this. I just love going into the motion. We were in the kitchen uh, with the kids and they they had were playing a CD and it was obviously they something that they had heard before, but to me I hadn't I hadn't heard it at all yet. It was some some kind of it was familiar in some way to me. And it was fun music and I I became interested and I started to think about it and I thought, where did this, where did this go? Like a kid who didn't want to take out the trash or didn't want to mow the lawn, I found for two years I avoided the answer to that. Why don't you do this music? And after two years I, I trusted her and I said, that's when I called John. 
I, I continued to play music, and I had a record deal in uh, Europe and uh, released a number of solo CDs and had a band all together. And the band was Blair Forward from the old Roving Boy days, was uh, Larry Cobb, and then Teddy Morgan, our guitar player, and, uh, and our producer. So I just said, what do you guys think about going to play with Kevin a little bit? I was like, okay, where, where, where do we go? You know, I was ready uh, instantly. I knew John so well, and I'd made the record, and I knew three of the other people in the band, and it was like, how great is this? I've known Teddy for a long time, and they brought me on basically to sing harmony and play guitar. And it was so great. I mean, from the get-go, it was it was a totally different experience than most of the bands I'd played in. I was in John's band, so I got to hear what um, Kevin and John were talking about. And at some point, it, it, John came to me and he said, hey, how would you feel about going to uh, Kevin's place in Shreveport while he was shooting The Guardian and just playing in, in his day off and just see how it goes? And I was going, yeah, of course I'll do that. And in they came. They came in the door, and I'm in there cooking huevos rancheros. Man, I love bacon. And they were great, but we were awful. But I was really happy. And I even had people from the crew come over, and we're in the living room we were playing. And it was, I was happy. I was really, really happy. And I knew that it was average. I knew that it was whatever, but it was, I, 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 I felt really good about my life. I felt really good about my friends. I felt really good about what we were doing. So they came down a second time, and then it was Super Bowl Sunday, and we had a chance to go down and play at a little sports bar, but we were supposed to practice. We were gonna practice today at my house, but I knew the company was gonna be here, so uh, we decided to practice in front of you. This was the first time he'd done it, and you know, years. Yeah, he was nervous. I just went ahead and started singing. And I thought, I don't, I don't want to hide behind the band. If you can't, you knew I was going to play, this is what it's going to be. But I, I knew I had some tough guys standing behind me. I'm so ready to play for you. When did the touring start getting serious? Well, it got serious when somebody wrote a check. Because that's serious. There's a freight train around through the dead of night. And it's straight for you, my. After the uh, little Super Bowl party, I went and played for the Air Force uh, there in Shreveport. Uh, and then we, we, we got a chance to play at a golf tournament. And that's where I really decided I wanted to play music wherever I was at. We got a, we got a check, our first check. And um, that was really serious to me. Bicycles, 
haven't had a master plan and, and we're still not set up to try to take advantage of the momentum that we actually have. I see you around. Did I think the band would tour like it? It has, no. But, you know, I always kind of had a feeling something would happen with it. If, if Kevin was serious, something could happen with it. It's all been just amazing to, to see all these different places in the world. Didn't Kevin cost long, but I thought it's much modern western down in Nogales. And in Luxembourg, you're driving around in a a minibus or minivan, and, and your song comes on the radio. The band got pretty excited about that, but I think that's probably, and that's what makes the band interesting. Okay. What did she say? Did she she say said that lucky all the girls and men who got tickets for tonight, that it's sold out, and that, uh, well, it was you with your modern band, and um, voila. Look, we're all at the age that we're at, but we can still be really excited about the neat things that happen in our life. And that was a neat moment for the band. And I didn't find myself that effusive, but I find myself looking at them and really happy. I'm like really happy what's happened for them. My only level of disappointment for, for me is that I can't go out there 200 days out of the year because that's what this band deserves to be able to do and I have to find a balance with the rest of my life. In Turkey, how did you find yourselves all locked out of your hotel rooms? I mean, it doesn't seem possible. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but you know, the interesting thing about that was not so much that it happened, but the way the band reacted, which is we just sat down, we continued to play in the hallway, and my wife went and got us food. There's a genuine quality about, about these guys. And what I appreciate about it, whether, what they don't know, and I, I'm not always able to tell them, is that I trust how they act in social situations, and it reflects really well on me. I, I appreciate that about them, that I'm not cleaning up messes. I don't have drama. They don't create drama for me. I'm used to working with a, just an incredible group of people that they're fun to travel with, and play music with. Here's to you guys. What is this bit of business, that a ritual you guys have with a toast? What is, it, is that tequila or champagne or what is it? I don't know who started that, but the, uh, I, I think John has traditionally um, uh, has done that probably before. He takes a shot of tequila. And I guess it was just something that he wanted to do. Here's the, here's the checks that don't bounce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we take that moment for ourselves, and it, and you know, I, you know, for for some guys, I think they're real worried that I'm going to pick them, and inevitably I do. It's their turn to, to toast, and uh, sometimes it, it's uh, it's very important to say something, something, and sometimes it just brings us together. We understand what we're trying to be about, um, and uh, it, it's just our it's just our little thing. There's been a lot of Kevin in my life and a lot of Kevin in your life, you know, and there's sometimes too much Kevin. And, uh, but uh, I, I believe the phenomena has been for me to have this opportunity <laughs> to work with really world-class musicians. Was the decision to call the new entity, the new band, Kevin Costner and Modern West, was that a marketing decision? No, that was a band yeah, it was purely a marketing decision. I, I, last thing I wanted to see was my name out front. I mean, I've known who I am for my whole life, and to attach a name to the band was something the band really felt that had to happen. Well, it was Kevin's idea to call it Modern West, and it was the band's idea to call it Kevin Costner and Modern West. Because we, I mean, there's no way you can't, you can just say Modern West when you're playing with Kevin. 
and uh, and 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 you know, I mean, we, we as modern West, we could play, have a have a good time, have a lot of fun, but but as Kevin Costner in Modern West, it becomes a much bigger entity. If you're saying that this is not a band about Kevin Costner, the opening that you have for your shows, which is an eight minute long, right. uh, carefully crafted right. montage of your, of right. your film highlights, right. seems to run sort of a counter to, to what your desire is. Not really. I want to break the ice as quickly as possible and say, by the way, a lot of songs that were written were written while I was making the movies you just saw. I, I, I need to tear down the wall of curiosity. I tear it down as quickly as I can. And I find that the movie thing, people relax suddenly. I go up, uh, I thank them for going to the movies. And I say, this is a night about rock and roll. And a lot of the songs that you'll hear were written on the sets of the movies that maybe you've really appreciated. And away we go. Kevin's still the movie star. When he comes on stage, it's, it's incredible, the, the, the crowd reaction. dealing with a language barrier. We're dealing with a whole set of song that no one's ever heard. But you know, this band has a lot of firepower. And they real and we understand that when we play that we can throw out a wall of music that's both friendly and has a kind of a feeling that people come away with. The audiences in Europe have not wanted to leave. They want to stay and clap and it just evolved to where I toast them in champagne because that's what happens in the song itself. There's a toasting and I sing with them to the song. I have a desire to do well. I don't have a desire to be popular. I, I have my own kind of code. Camrose was, um, uh, was pretty important for us. It was gonna be another large crowd. You know, people just took us seriously as a band. And now we were, here we are, we were playing um, in Camrose and, and on our way out in a helicopter, we found out that, that, that we were kind of a band that people wanted to see. Well, Camrose was, uh, you know, the country festival in Canada and that was, uh, most musicians, we've all been on festivals where it might rain, and, and I think most people are like, we're gonna make it through, the crowd makes it through, we're gonna make it through, we're gonna play. My, well, everybody has a different experience with cameras. It's scary that, you know, it, it was, it's hard to remember exactly what happened. It was really fast, really frightening in retrospect at the time. I mean, it all happened so fast you don't, you don't really have time. We didn't really have time to be scared. And about it, an hour before we were about to go on, 
a guy, one of the men came up and said, you know, uh, uh, there, a, a tornado has touched down about 70 miles away. We think we're going to get a little rain, but then we're going to start back up. He said the word tornado. I remember that specifically, but there was no feeling that, you know, okay, something, you know, but it was like, it's going to bring rain. I start to see the things blowing, and now the tent, the, the canvases have been untied, and they're kind of blowing into the air, and blowing into the air, and our guys are on stage, and and I look, I, I'm able to look through the stage, past the crowd of 25, 30,000 people, way in the distance, and I could tell there was something weird with the sky. It was kind of yellow. It was kind of dark. And, and the wind started getting bigger, and I kept looking. And pretty soon, something was wrong. Somebody had tapped on my shoulder and said, hey, you know, we got to get out of here. Just forget about it. This is, this is, let's go. And like seconds later, that's when this thing started flying, and people were running. And they beat me off the stage. They went to the left. I went down a ramp. I made a left turn. I started running, running, and I ran out of stage back behind. I couldn't see, and I stopped. And I knew I had made a mistake by going back. And I looked up, and like a bad Godzilla movie, I saw the stage come down on me. And in the corner of my eye, I saw a girder buckle. And that's when I yelled, let's run. And there was a semi truck behind the stage that was open and empty. And for some reason, I ran in there. And I ran right up again to the very back of it, to the cab. And a truss came right through the, 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 cat, the, um, the trailer. I didn't know where Kevin was. I didn't know where anyone was. Park came, and, you know, and he looked like out of a war zone. He was dazed, and blood was coming down his head. And then we heard reports about our tour manager, Mark Bodding, was really hurt. There was my friend lying in a pool of blood, and he, I thought, I thought he was dead. I thought he was. I, I was sure he was going to die. I inched myself. This out. was your tour manager. That was Mark Bodding, and I found him, and and I just held him, and blood was coming out. Uh, and I, I just, um, I, I took my shirt off and I compressed it to his head. We were lucky. Mark didn't die. I thought he was going to. Uh, and and, and uh, the guys were hurt. Park was hurt, really hurt. That whole week, I just, you know, every day I wanted to call family members, friends, and just tell them that I love them. Um, which we should do every day. We don't do every day. You know, some people, we, we say that too really easily. Some people we don't say it too easily, but I found myself, you know, that the week following that really wanting to, you know, just express that. You know, I played it over in my mind so many times. I've even had grief counseling over it because it just was like, I came back and I was, I couldn't shake it. I've always thought that I've had a high survival instinct, but I realized that nature took that away from me at that moment. Uh, going back from my friends, whatever mistakes I made, um, I could have, I might not have seen my family again and people that I love, and, and uh, that was very real. It's sort of a collective idea. I have relatives there, and, uh, and they mean a lot to me. And um, uh, when we were touring through the Midwest, it was, uh, it was just, the, 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 a lot of the people had just really just asked us if there, we could possibly stop by or at least come through or they kept we, we heard every a lot of people talking about how much they loved Leland the song Leland Iowa and how and how much it meant to them and uh, and so we just kind of collectively decided just to take a detour go in and play in a barn Thank you. Well, here's a song you came to hear, and, and um, we're proud to play it for you. <laughs> Sing along if you know any of the words. You got a dime. Don't throw well, it on We can't see it. We can't see it. And we can't see the back. I love that. I wasn't looking to embarrass you, man. I just want to make sure I see all them pretty girls. <laughs>
Your big is a house. <laughs> Oh, you know, we all we'll stand and we'll, we'll just celebrate each other, but I, I really want you to see and hear the song. You do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> your it's your song, it's your town. You know, Leela and I was written when John came to visit me uh, when I was making Field of Dreams. Um, uh, that's why, you know, that's why we do lead off with the movies, because they are connected to what we have done and what we've been a part of and when people have come to see me. And then we went down the street and played in the cafe. There's actually a jar, you can spend a dime, and I think people drop a dime in there. But the jar said, you can spend a dime. Oh, does it? Yes. Yeah. I heard there was a jar there, so I got, I got the... Uh, I got the marketing wrong. <laughs> I think that was fantastic. I think that was the best thing I've seen a long darn, darn time. Coop has just been very generous about letting people in on songs, and uh, it's pretty clear that I'm probably the weakest link when it comes to the songwriting. At least uh, I would say that, and I think uh, I think I'm a shrewd judge of talent. So <laughs> I would have to say, no, Kev, you're not the best songwriter. You're you're um, there are things that you contribute, but you know. Uh, those guys are, are, I think, are really gifted, and I think they understand the things I have to sing about and want to sing about. There's no like trying to write a song for Kevin. It's writing a song, and if it resonates, then that's what happens. But, but also, Kevin, Kevin provides a lot of ideas and a lot of direction and a, and a lot of. Uh, involvement in all aspects of the writing of the song. Remember I told you sometime Maybe I thought I heard great. a bridge there? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there we there need a bridge, but yeah. maybe vocally I can do something that bridges it. When he says he's the weakest link, we don't think so, because, because there's a, all sorts of different ways 
that you can be involved in the song and make it, make it a better song. Five Minutes from America is, is it's a rocker to be yeah, sure. Yeah, five minutes, five minutes to America was was a function of being in Shreveport and seeing, you know, and understanding because a lot of the crew that was coming to work every day had lost everything in New Orleans. And because John was down there a lot and I was I was there for two movies in a row, that began to that began to percolate through us that those people were still coming to work every day with their hearts on the ground. And so you know, and we all saw how the people ended up in Houston. So we've got that one verse that says, you know, you know, back down the road, you know, a policeman offered his hand. He said, he said, welcome, stranger, but you really can't stay here, man. On up ahead, there's some opportunities. You can find them everywhere. Maybe go to Houston. There's a lot of you there. If you had to play one song, that would define the band for someone who has never heard it. What would the song be? For me, it would be uh, Superman 14. John and I both love Superman so much. It's a, it's a song about youthful aspiration and, uh, and becoming yourself. I feel like Superman flying all the muddy rivers Count everything for one to fourteen All the roads where the sunflowers grow I can see from here to eternity We just figured if we couldn't make it on our own songs then, then we didn't want to do it. The fact is with an actor when he gets up and plays with a band he's got, he's got, they give him like three strikes basically three songs and if they don't like it, they're gone. And so it's, it's just been amazing because Kevin, Kevin is an amazing performer. We're going to bring out a friend to help us sing. Say hello to Sarah. Let me be the name you whisper when you dream in the night. The song, Let Me Be the One, uh, doesn't work without your wife singing on it. <laughs> She's really great. When that song was written and recorded, we needed a female vocalist to represent the duet half. So, uh, so Teddy asked Sarah to sing it and sent it to Kevin. Kevin heard it and was like, I love this. Let's just, you know, let's do this. So, um, and he's, you know, he's been so sweet about bringing her out on the road ever since then. And it's, it's become a, a really nice moment in the show. It's just, it's great to have all these experiences and not have to get home and go, well, here are pictures from all these places we went, but to have her, have her a part of that, you know, and that the band has accepted her so much and, and, and you know, just treats her like one of the guys and, and always with respect and, and it seems to really enjoy having her around. Let me be the one.
this will be our third record. You know, we're, we're presently flirting with 17 songs and we'll have to break it down to 10. But when we make up a set list, we really, we, ha we pull from about 40 songs now. And after this record, we'll be pulling from more than that. We're gonna start in Europe because that's where it's coming out. And then I, um, I'll see what movies I'm gonna do. And then I would like to play an American tour. I don't want to jinx anything, but I, I just can't imagine we still wouldn't be doing this in, in five years. We, we all love doing it. We all love to be with each other. It's not just my job, it's, it's like kind of my best friends. The average life of a band is four, it's like a life of a pro athlete. It's about four or five years. You start making money off of your music, the egos come in and ban in the band is destroyed and uh, but this we figured four or five years with this band but it's just uh, for some reason it's just gotten better and better you know I, I feel like we're gonna we're gonna probably keep about the same pace that we keep now because everybody's so busy and they have families but I, I feel like there's a comfort level where we go out like once a month for about a week and then then we'll do a tour like if it's in Europe um, maybe do a couple tours like that a year plus the weekly things and then you know I'm sure we're gonna stumble on a hit song here and there I mean there's it's great music and I hope we're sitting here doing another interview in front of the ocean uh, I think there will be I mean I, I think that everybody enjoys it too much you know I mean we all We'll keep finding excuses to get together and play. Let's make it something that we really enjoy, and let's make it something that we look forward to. And as long as that's what we keep in mind, I, I think we will keep finding ways to get together. I see you around. Let the light shine, man. I see you around. My best instincts are all made some of the best movies that I'll made in this next five years. We will have played for people around the world. I want to take care of myself. And, and as long as I think it's relevant, I'll do it. You know, as long as I feel like uh, I look relevant on the stage. I'm just going to keep playing original music. I'm going to keep playing with my friends. And the minute it doesn't feel right, I'm going to stop. <laughs>